bought an old upright piano for $50 and said I was going to play the piano. That was when I was all the ripe age of seven. And since I was in this little town that didn't have anybody I liked, might as well play the piano. She was Miss Les, Mrs. Les. I just had, I just loved her. I went over there and she was the nicest thing. And if I missed a note, she just put the name of the note on there. I didn't have to think anything. It was just, I loved her. She didn't teach me a thing. But I loved going to piano lessons. <laughs> then along about the sixth grade, we moved to Jonesboro, Arkansas. Started piano lessons with this uh, woman named Signal Wood. Now, uh, Miss Signa had a very, very good reputation about being, you know, she was mean. Oh. And when I walked in there, I just, you know, tried to do my boy's charm. It didn't work at all. And uh, she put up with me about, oh, maybe six or seven months. And it was time to get a little recital. And I was supposed to play this duet. And I didn't see any need to count. That was a waste of time. Well, I'll never forget that day that I was going doing something absolutely wrong. And she took the music, threw it across the room, shook her finger and said, Ronald Bennett, if you can't go up here, I never want to see you again in my life. And I was cool just saying, if I ever get out here live, I'll count from now on out. So I did. I had a pretty good thing. I've been spoiled all my life. I would go to my classes in the morning at high school and practice four hours in the afternoon. I had some recitals, and I did get a scholarship to College of Music. And went up there, and from there on, I, you know, did what I was supposed to do to make my grades there. But Signa Wood was the one that kicked me upstairs. And, you know, sometimes we have a student, we just don't have to kick them upstairs, but we have to just not give in to anything. Make them come to your standards. And so, yes, I'm the result of that. She didn't throw me across the room. <laughs> you know, you have to suffer to be a piano teacher. So I had a little town that was about 25 miles from Cincinnati called Harrison, Ohio. That was right on the Indiana-Ohio border. So I would get up on a cold Saturday morning. Now, Cincinnati is built on a series of 13 hills. And I would get out of there at 6 o'clock in the morning, slide, and there was this one hill that I would slide down. I hope we stop, the stop signs there. I don't know if the brakes going to work. But we got there, and I got over to uh, Harrison, Ohio, and taught in the school. Of course, they didn't heat the school on the weekends. Why I didn't die in the I don't know, but I did. But uh, I had a lot of good students there, some that actually, but then I learned how to teach, you know, under rather... Good situation. You ruin your first 500 students. <laughs> we know that. You're either too strict, which I was, too strict, or too easy. Now, it's easier to be too strict and lighten up than it is to be easy and then try to get harder. So I learned all my mistakes before I ever graduated from school. Then I had some. I had one little girl that wound up going to the College of Music and graduating. And so you see, but that's from those early things. So I, I had a lot of fun. Oh, I think it's interesting to see a student come in and know nothing. And then if you do the right thing, they begin to like it. And then maybe not like it, and you have to turn it into something that they do. And then to see it. And some, of course, should be taking, you know, soccer lessons or something. But <laughs> as far as, as that, when you see somebody that really responds to your teaching. That's fun. You're always in for a surprise. I mean, at my advanced age, 
I have a little girl, boy, who came in, oh, about two months ago. His second lesson came in here. I was not in the room when he came. He was sitting at the piano there with a three-foot-tall Dr. Seuss hat on. I wasn't expecting that. So I taught Dr. Seuss. I mean, after all, why not? I had one student that came in. Something was wrong with the parents. You knew something was wrong because the parents sat on either side of the piano. What is this? What is that? And the little girl was like, what? What? Okay. And I said, ease up. <laughs> See, sometimes you teach the parent. I said, this child, she will probably make a mistake. That's not the end of the world. But, but, but ah, she shouldn't make a mistake. Well, yes, she should. We learn from our mistakes. They didn't last very long. But, you know, it, that was probably the worst one I had. And then there was a guy that came in and smoked a cigar. During this, and that, that was pretty bad. <laughs> I had to say, we don't smoke in the city. But anyway. Well, I think, let's say that you've just graduated from college with a degree, and you owe everything. Doesn't do you one bit of good. you got to remember that that little eight-year-old doesn't know anything. They will only know what you teach them. And you oh, well, they should have known that. No, they shouldn't. That's up to you. Now, I had a teacher in college. Her name is Mildred Emma Rapp. R-A-P-P. -P. And she was a little chunky woman with shocker gray hair and brown eyes that when you looked at her, she would look all the way through you. But she was a typical little woman who had gone to college and then mother died and there she was teaching at the college and she had never really had a life except that teaching. And so one time, I'd, been, I'd had her at the, the end of my sophomore year. She said, Mr. Bennett, okay, I have something I want to discuss with you. This is in 1954. She had had a 1933 DeSoto Coupe she had driven from 1933 to 1954. And she had gone out, and that was the first time they started making. She bought a baby blue with a white top, Bel Air Chevrolet. She said, you know, Mr. Bennett, I've been teaching here, and she always, always called me Mr. Bennett. <laughs> I've been teaching here ever since I was a girl, and she was good. She could smell parallel fits when you walk into the room. You know, she never looked at paper. She knew exactly what she'd done wrong. But she said, you know, I've hated every minute of it. I said, really? She said, yes, this is where I was, but I really wanted to be a writer. So she took a correspondence course in, uh, in writing, and she wanted to write for children, about like Sunday school pamphlets, things like that. So she did. She was very good. And so, uh, she would be, can you do something that long and hate every minute of it? Kicking parallel fifths or wrong arrangements of things, you know. But she was very good. <laughs> but the thing about it is, after uh, I graduated, she would send me a Christmas card, and on it she would have her little poetry she had written to me. To, to do that. Which she died a happy old woman. But don't do something you hate. If you don't like to teach music, don't do it. You know, <laughs> don't do it if it's if it's something you just don't want to do. Mm -hmm. This is a nice piece. Mm -hmm. and Jennifer Robinson. She. One of these little blonde girls with pale blue eyes, you know, or just everything. But what does this sound? What is it like? What is this? It's water. It's water. Okay.
student comes in and has not practiced at all that week, you've we've all heard it, you know. <laughs> oh, how really? would you? Yeah. How would you use the lesson? All of my students practice every day. <laughs> <laughs> I also lie a lot. Well, we just take the piece and we learn the last week's lesson. I mean, if it's something they need to do. Now, if it's a piece, maybe they're tired, we, we just start something else or do something else. Yeah. So you have them practice it right there? Sometimes. Yes. Or sometimes we get up and walk around the room. <laughs> You know. Well, of course, they used to be back in the day, is not just John Thompson. Yes. It's like, what's on the next page? That's why I used to call the page turning teacher. Oh, let's see what's on the next page. Oh, we need, oh it's a, well, I, I have a hard time sticking with a method of I, I have used way back, I used Aaron a lot. That was a good thing. And then I use the uh, uh, the beginning things of that uh, Palmer had the creating music series, and then of course I don't get stuck in too many method books. But I usually basically now use favor and favor mm -hmm. because it's open up, and, and I usually use it for the adult. Okay. And uh, that's, that's, that's usually what I use right now. Okay. And then I've used creating the uh, the uh, music all the way. Uh, McGill work. Okay. And then of course, there's nothing wrong with David Card Lover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, the good old timers. Well, first of all, the, the whole culture has changed. When I first started out here, I would have students where Papa would come in and said, Sam, you're going to learn to play the piano. Now, by God, I couldn't have it, but I can't. You're going you're to like it. Yeah, sure. No. Now, we have more educated parents. But they're there because they had an exposure to the arts and they want their child to have it. That's the main thing I see. As opposed to, it's a whole thing. But you go, Odessa is not a cultural town, basically, because we had oil field workers that are, now these oil field workers have made some good money, so they've got time for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But the thing that first came out here was like, what is this, you know, what is this? So now I get people in here that know why they're here. Mm -hmm. They have been to a symphony concert. Oh. They have heard some things on TV and what have you. Ideas on how to motivate students, especially teens, if they start to lose interest or are, you can tell that they've kind of lost their motivation. Switch everything around. We're not going to do that this week. We're going to do that. What are we doing, man? Sure, yeah. Oh, can you do that? Well, how about making up a channel on that? And you're going, well, never mind. What do you mean? Everybody do it. I don't know. In other words, you have to have a little tool. Because there, he's the cutest boy, and the hair on his legs are so cute. Well, oh, I don't mind supposed to be practical. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I said, quit thinking about your hairy legged foot as a basketball player. And think about your music. You know, and so, you, you have to do everything. They have, and they, they live in such... A, a terribly oppressive situation. The teens right now know too much, and they know the, they know things they don't understand, and that is hard. Mm -hmm. So it's up to us to be that steady rock mm -hmm. that's there, and there sometimes they come in, and I'm sure you've had it. We don't touch the piano. We sit there and. They talk out of their head, you know? Yes. Sometimes they just talk out of their head. Yes. I had a girl one time who was a, a unique student. She could only see out of one eye if she did it this way. Mm -hmm. You know? So we learned one hand, we learned the other, and we put it together. And 
she came in one day and she started crying. What is it? Well, their mother and daddy were divorced, and both parents were rather prominent people. And daddy said for me to tell mother this. And I said, okay. And, I, and, I, and she said, I said, that's all right. You just go there and cry. It's all right. I called her mother up. I said, let me say, I don't care how you and your ex-husband like or don't like each other. That's none of my business. You can kill each other. I don't care. The minute you start upsetting my student, that is my business. I went to her office and she was like, she had not thought what they were doing. That, that poor kid, the sixth grader, and come see and mm -hmm. had this and they said this and mother said this. And, no, that's my student. You cannot upset my student. He said, thank you. I didn't even know that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. sometimes you just have to intervene. You know? I wrote this piece a long time ago. And when it came out, they didn't know it. But the only thing I ever remember or ever having, my mother's mother was this little china headed doll. Just like that. She had a little black dress on her. That's the only thing I remember. Sarah he is my gosh. <laughs> Recitals can be awfully dull, you know. And I don't want. To. First of all, I have an interesting thing on recitals. How long are my recitals? No more than forty-five minutes. I may have two recitals. Yes. And if you want to stay for the second one, you can. But the recital you have, you have to go sit through is forty-five minutes. Right. Now I have a lot of things in the studio. Now I call come and goes. Mm -hmm. you know, Oh, come between four and six, doesn't matter, just come. That's the relaxed way to do things. But when we have our end of the year recital, uh, I, we go out to college, we have those nine foot sign, we grant, and we do the whole thing. So we do, so I got to think, you know. So I said, okay, one year it was like, we have to dress the piano, the match piano keyboard. What? Well, it's black and white, what do you think? Well, I don't care. So they came anywhere from tuxedos to, you know, t-shirts and, and black pants, what have you. It was fun. Uh -huh. So from that point on, I started thinking, well, all right, we can do it different. And so I have this friend who is a private clothing salesman. He comes here and measures me and does everything here. So I, I said, I called him up oh, when, they, when they had their fall show. I said, okay. I need to know what the end color for spring is. <laughs> well, it's going to be green this year. So suddenly, our May recital has to wear something green. Well, they can find it. Now, I didn't say a dress. <laughs> it has to be something green. One time I had it, I said, you have to wear a pastel color. Well, I don't, they can be, I have a pastel dot on the thumb. Mm -hmm. So it's, they get the way of, of what they're doing. They can show their individual. I think I told you about the time that we had the uh, the, the, uh, the end of the Alamo. Match yeah. the Alamo. Yes. How they had to dress the way they dressed at the Alamo. I had one little boy come with a bloody bandage around his head. <laughs>
students with performance anxiety. How do you help them get through that? Scare them to death. <laughs> All right. Performance anxiety does not start the week before the recital. Right. It's all year long. Yeah. Oh, play that for me. Let me see what they're doing. Oh, yeah, that's good. They start, yeah. Then I have what I call come and go. Mm -hmm. It's about every, well, probably twice a semester. They come, very informal. They come anytime between four and six, I don't care. Mm -hmm. They have to come and play. Oh, you didn't like that. Well, you play better. You play better than that, can't you? And they used to perform it that way. So many students are here at the same time listening yeah, to I each other. Or... You know, whoever shows up. <laughs> Early on, I was teaching. If I got to somebody that was about to get a little bit dull, you know, it, was a, it had you know, a couple of years bad. So I teach him Great Smoky Mountains by yes. David Cardlove. So I said, God, now look, if you want me to be a Beethoven, I'm not. I know that. But you've given me enough talent that I can do something. So why don't you let me just write one piece that's as good as Pupil Saver. Pupil Saver, yes. You shouldn't write. Yes. He said, okay. And he did. That's it. She was an she had a uh, she was wanting to learn to sing for a reason, but she had a obviously a not too nice divorce or was in the process of something. So uh, we came to the come and go. She came and sat down and stayed the whole time. We just sat there and cried because that was the first time she had seen children having oh. fun. Everything, everything. I just mm -hmm. let her sit there and cry. Okay. I had three little girls. So I started, you know, like fourth grade, second grade, first grade. So I had a little girl, little younger, little older. So she was doing something crazy. I said, Sarette, if you play that note one more time, I'm going to. Turn you, I'm going to turn you into a frog. She thought that was funny. <laughs> so she went home and told her, My Miss Prince said you're going to turn me into a frog. Okay. Well, then her older sister, Miss Prince said you're going to turn me into a frog. Next week they showed up with a picture of a frog. Okay. So suddenly, oh, Mr. Bennett collects, you've seen this, Mr. Bennett collects frogs, or his so and so collects owls, or what have you. Suddenly, Another frog showed up. And then another. If you look around, you'll see frog things. If you look out there, see all these little cases. They're all filled with frogs. They're from all over the world. Everything like that. So Mr. Bennett liked frogs. Now, Mr. Bennett is a male piano teacher. What do you give a male piano teacher at Christmas? A bottle of shaving lotion. You know how it takes me to use a bottle of shaving lotion? Maybe three years. <laughs> so, instead of, I understand there was a teacher in love because we got 29 bottles of, you know, aftershave for Christmas. So Mr. Ben got frogs. <laughs> and they would be, and I knew when other department stores would have, I would get one, I would maybe have six or seven on the top lined up or whatever the top of the shelf up there, you know, all the same thing. But get Mr. Bennett frog. And you even have a sign on your door. That's right. And then I have boxes of frogs I put out occasionally. 
But that's just one of the things. And then uh, my relationship, I fully rely on God. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. or they eat what bugs them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they eat what bugs them. Mm -hmm. So that's that so that was a little, first of all then, that is a way of what? Making somebody feel a little bit less scared mm -hmm. coming to a studio. How can you be afraid if somebody's got fog over there? Shades of Bach, right? 